In nature, the battle for survival is often decided by one critical resource, food. When getting enough to eat is literally the difference between life and death, animals will diversify in some pretty extreme ways to meet this challenge. And there's perhaps no better example of this than the iguanas of the Galapagos Islands. Here, two close relatives, the marine iguana and the Galapagos land iguana, have adapted to solve the same problem in two very different ways. Today, we want to show you how these incredible lizards are making a living for themselves out here and answer one very important question. Which of these iguanas is really the better survivor? At first glance, the Galapagos Islands look like a tropical paradise, but life in this archipelago is much harsher than it appears. It may not look like it, but vegetation is typically very scarce here, so for herbivores like iguanas, finding enough food to sustain themselves is actually quite the struggle. And trust me, you wouldn't want to face the threats these guys have to deal with on an empty stomach. Luckily for the iguanas, they've come up with some ingenious solutions to get the food they so desperately need, and it's their unique but equally fascinating survival strategies that we'll be investigating today. My name is Evan, and this is Harrison. We're twin brothers on a mission to make you an insider in the amazing stories of survival that shape the natural world. But to get this showdown between land and sea started, we first need to find the more elusive of the two species we're comparing, the Galapagos land iguana. To do that, we've come to the uninhabited island of Plazas, which is actually one of the most reliable places in the archipelago to see these lizards. This excursion was well worth it, because almost immediately after we stepped off the boat, we encountered exactly what we were looking for. This is exactly what we were hoping to see. Right behind me is the Galapagos land iguana, the closest relative of the marine iguana here in the archipelago. Now their evolution is actually fascinating. Land iguanas and marine iguanas share a common ancestor, and it's believed that they diverged around 4.5 million years ago. And this is really interesting because that's around the same time that the Galapagos Islands would have began to form. So the life stories of these iguanas is intimately connected with the history of these islands. The Galapagos land iguana is one of the largest lizard species in the entire world. They can grow up and over a meter and a half. That's about five feet long. So it's pretty hard to miss these lizards when you're out in the environment. Now land iguanas are diurnal active foragers. So they spend a great deal of their time, especially in the mornings and early evenings, actively searching for food. But it gets so hot in the Galapagos that oftentimes they actually need to take shelter during the peak heat of the day. Like all reptiles, they have to thermoregulate or maintain their body temperature by moving from warm spots to cool spots and back again because they can't do that on their own. So when it reaches those insanely hot temperatures, they need to take shelter under cactuses or rocks or any other kind of shelter they can find. It was pretty incredible to see the iguanas sitting out on lava rocks that had been baking in the sun all day. They were hot to the touch for us, but for the iguanas, they literally did not bat an eye. This environment is one of the most rugged and alien looking habitats we've ever explored, Absolutely. I think. And one of the first things you might ask when you see this habitat, I know it's one of the first things I thought of, is what are the iguanas actually eating out here? Because it really doesn't look like there's a lot out here for them. But luckily, as we hiked further into the interior of the island, we got to find out for ourselves. Evan is getting some amazing shots of a land iguana actually eating. This is something we really wanted to see. Yep, this is definitely an adult. It looks pretty healthy. I see a nice thick tail. It's great to see that they're able to still find a lot of vegetation, even on such a barren island. Land iguanas have a pretty traditional diet as far as iguanas are concerned. They'll eat pretty much any palatable plant that they can find, from leaves and flowers to fruits and even the pads of cactuses, spines and all. And in some places, cactuses like the Apuntio, which are all over Plazas, make up up to 80% of their diet. It's also where they're getting pretty much all of their water from, mm -hmm. because in normal conditions, there is very little standing fresh water in the Galapagos. So the iguanas are able to get pretty much all the moisture they need from the foods that they eat. The land iguanas are very much generalist herbivores, so any kind of plant they can find is fair game. But they do still have a lot of challenges that they have to overcome with this diet. 
The main one is that the Galapagos Islands typically do not have very much vegetation around. They're extremely arid and sparse in the best of times, and conditions can be so rough that oftentimes the bigger leafy plants will actually go dormant for long periods of the year. So there is not as much food out there as it looks like for the iguanas. Because of that, they're quite opportunistic, and they will actually supplement their diet with insects and even pieces of carrion if they have the opportunity. Another difficulty that the iguanas face in getting their food is that there's a lot of competition for this vegetation, and everything from birds like finches to other reptiles like giant tortoises will compete for these vital resources. That is one problem that the marine iguanas don't have to deal with so much, because they have specialized to feed almost exclusively on a food source that virtually no other large animal in the islands can touch. Algae. Unlikely as it may seem, marine iguana evolution has been shaped in large part by their algivorous diet. Yes, there's a word for that. But it turns out that not all algae is created equal. Marine iguanas have had to specially adapt their digestive system to process this unusual food source. And they greatly prefer green and red algae because these types are easy to digest. They tend to avoid the ever-present brown algae, though, as it has fewer nutrients and is much harder to break down. And considering the fact that even a one kilogram iguana will eat three to four percent of its body weight in algae every day, what they eat matters. We actually made a whole video about the incredible feeding abilities of the marine iguana. And if you want to learn more about how they make it work and see this technique for yourself, Check out that episode with the info card in the top right or in the description when you're done with this video. One of the main benefits of specializing to eat algae is that it is incredibly plentiful in the islands. They're completely surrounded by extremely rich marine environments, which means that all the rocks around the shorelines are covered in algae. And really, it's only fish and small invertebrates that are going after it, so the marine iguanas have virtually no competition for the food that they're eating. So it does provide them a big advantage, the real problem comes with accessing it. The best and most abundant algae grows beneath the surface, but because the water that surrounds the Galapagos Islands is so cold, only the biggest and strongest adult iguanas are able to dive beneath the waves to access it. For the smaller individuals and the juveniles, they're pretty much forced to wait until the tide goes out, and then they can feed on all the algae that encrusts the exposed rocks. But that means that there's really only a limited window of time each day that they're able to get their food and there aren't all that many good places for them to forage either, so it's really a limited window that they have to get all the food and energy they'll need for the whole day. The reason for that is because not only do the iguanas have to worry about going where the algae is, they also need to be able to leave the water and immediately start bringing their body temperature back up because they're very vulnerable after feeding. So they have to balance going somewhere where the food is close enough that they can actually reach it and have somewhere safe for them to leave the water and bring their body temperatures back up after they've eaten. Now, unfortunately, it's not just the physical challenges of reaching the food that the marine iguanas have to deal with. And in fact, both species of iguanas are facing unprecedented new dangers from a source that they did not evolve to handle, humans. Probably the biggest challenges that land iguanas are facing in the Galapagos are human development and competition with invasive species, both of which have caused massive declines in land iguana populations and even extirpations, or localized extinctions, of land iguanas in many parts of their historic range. Land iguanas typically live in the scrublands and arid forests of the island's lowland regions, which is exactly where the majority of the towns in the Galapagos are built, including all of the biggest and most developed areas. This essentially pushes the land iguanas out, as they are under constant threat from cars, human harassment, and probably worst of all, invasive predators like cats and dogs. Not only that, but humans have brought all kinds of domesticated species to the islands, including goats, cows, horses, and chickens, all of which feed extensively on the same food sources that the land iguanas rely on. They may have evolved here and adapted over millions of years to be successful in these environments, but even that doesn't allow them to outcompete herbivores like goats or cows, because these mammals are larger, faster, and more mobile than the iguanas most of the time, not to mention that they reproduce much more rapidly due to human intervention. 
These anthropogenic forces have made things much harder for the land iguanas, but surprisingly, that's not necessarily true for the marine iguanas. Because their food source isn't really taken by the invasive species at all, the marine iguanas don't have to deal with the same level of competition that the land iguanas do. They really only need to worry about invasive predators like cats, dogs, and rats eating their juveniles. As for humans, marine iguanas don't really seem to mind us that much, and tens of thousands of them have moved into the towns and can be seen basking on benches, docks, and even right in the middle of the road. You can think of it this way. Humans and land iguanas compete directly for habitat, but humans and marine iguanas are more like very close next-door neighbors. We don't tend to destroy their beaches or the rocky shorelines where their food grows because those are the types of areas that humans really love to use in the islands as well, which is a major advantage for the marine iguanas. It's not that human development is better for them than natural habitat, but they seem to have a much easier time integrating into it than the land iguanas do. The challenges that the iguanas face affect them each differently, and they've responded accordingly in very different ways, which raises the important question, which of them is actually the better survivor? Now to answer that, it helps to know how many iguanas there are in the islands today. Exploring here on Plazas was absolutely incredible. We saw far more land iguanas than I expected to. Yeah, we were told that there are over 350 land iguanas on Plazas alone, and for the size of the island, that's a pretty high density of iguanas. Now, there are over 10,000 dispersed across the archipelago, but compared to the marine iguanas, that population is pretty small. Absolutely, marine iguanas number anywhere from 200,000 to 300,000 based on the best estimates. The difference in those numbers is pretty significant to say the least. A population that's 25 times larger than the other may make it seem like the answer to whose strategy is better is pretty clear. But let's say for the sake of argument that we mean whose strategy is more effective ecologically in the absence of confounding variables like human activities. Now we're gonna hit you with a bit of a cop out here, but you can't really pick a winner when it comes to comparing two different animals' ecological strategies because they're both honed for that animal's particular lifestyle and when you just compare their ecology, they're clearly both the right answers to help them survive into the future because they're both here video over and no. with that we hope you enjoy <laughs> and we'll see you in the next one. no the the thing is objectively there is no winner in this sort of comparison but what we can figure out is who is doing better right now whose adaptations are helping them survive in the face of everything that's going on in the islands and that's a more interesting question i think and actually our personal experiences in the galapagos went a long way to helping us figure out an answer to this question now, something that's very important for this discussion is the context that we visited the Galapagos at a very unique and unusual time. We were actually there during one of the worst El Nino events on record. El Nino events are part of a natural climatic cycle that affects the atmospheric and oceanic conditions of the Pacific Ocean by altering the wind patterns and therefore the currents that basically create the climatic conditions that different regions experience. Leading to drastically higher sea surface temperatures and overall warmer, less nutrient-rich water, which is devastating for the aquatic wildlife of the Galapagos because the entire marine ecosystem becomes far less productive. And El Nino brings a lot of rain to the Galapagos, which means all the land plants flourish, and that's why the habitats looked so bizarre when we were there. With the habitats being so lush and green even out on Plazas, the land iguanas were doing really well, which is what we'd expect to see. More water and more vegetation means happy land iguanas, and they were taking full advantage of this unusual abundance. However, as is becoming a theme in this video, the marine iguanas had the opposite problem. And when we were exploring the ocean environments off of several of the islands, it was impossible not to notice that things weren't how they should be. If you spend any time in the Pacific Ocean along the coast of the Americas, you'll know that the water is often very cold. And in the Galapagos, it's especially so because they sit right in the path of the Humboldt Current that comes up from Antarctica. And that's what brings many of the nutrients that the local wildlife relies on. When we were there, the water was so warm that the aquatic ecosystems were suffering immensely. Algae and plankton populations were dying off at disturbing rates, and some of the marine iguanas that we encountered did not look like they were in the best of health. But the biggest difference in our observations between the two species was how many we actually saw, and this is where the marine iguana starts to pull ahead in this competition. 
Land iguanas really struggle to cohabitate with people, so you're pretty much only going to see them around human settlements in a select few places around the island. But marine iguanas have totally adapted to human presence in the Galapagos, and they can make their homes just about anywhere, no matter how much we've modified the habitat. Seeing marine iguanas resting or basking in the middle of the towns was literally a daily occurrence, and you pretty much can't go anywhere in the islands without seeing a bunch of these lizards hanging around. Overall, the combination of maintaining more of their historic range, feeding on a much more specialized food source with less competition, and their vastly superior ability to integrate into human settlements means that the marine iguana is definitely doing better in the islands right now. Yeah, I think I would give it to the marine iguanas. Their population being larger definitely counts for something, and overall it's their adaptability that really clinches it for them, I think. That being said, both iguana species need our conservation support, because without managing our developmental impact on the islands and addressing the climate crisis, both of these irreplaceable lizards could be lost forever. The fact that the marine iguana has come out on top in this little competition is a perfect example of how even the most bizarre and unlikely strategies can end up being exactly what a species needs to thrive. And the way that these lizard stories have diverged proves that there's always more than one way to overcome life's greatest challenges. However, with much more severe threats from climate change and human development looming on the horizon, the fight to protect the iguanas is only just beginning. And even though it may not feel like it, we're all a part of this story too. It's crazy to think about, but our everyday actions have a profound impact on wildlife all over the world because of the ways that human activities drive climate change. So any decisions we make to lessen our impact on the environment or support efforts to combat the climate crisis directly affect the incredible wildlife here in the Galapagos. Oh, one quick thing. This is the first time we've compared different survival strategies in this way. And if this is something you want to see more of, let us know down in the comments. We have a lot of ideas for more videos in this style, and all we're waiting for to produce them is enough interest from all of you. Now, the iguanas aren't the only animals that have used their unique adaptations to beat the odds out here. And if you want to learn about another of the island's most fascinating stories of success, check out this video, where we dive deep into the life of the famous Galapagos sea lion and expose the dark side of our seemingly idyllic relationship with them. And with that, we hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you in the next one.